G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. It's a very exciting this week, week this week because we've got a special guest to talk about the new Hyundai N car. It is Jack Quick. Hello. Jack is back. Hello, yes I am. I spent a week in Portugal and now I'm back on the podcast. Yeah. Lots of fun. Back in the office and doing some work, thankfully. Oh, yes, thankfully, yeah. of course. Yes, you had a holiday, I'm oh, sure. Yes, of course. It wasn't like I was busting my ass, but anyway. No, no, but we, we won't talk about too much about what you did in Portugal, but we will come back to that. But James is here as well. How are you, mate? Hello, hello. Thank you for having me back. Yes, well, Not there's, that a, special. there's a big promise we've got to fulfill this week because we said we were going to talk about Triton. Yes. And now we're allowed to talk about we Triton. We're allowed to talk about it and I can address questions comments all the things yes so we will get to that later in the show um but first of all jack is here and he's a special guest tell us what were you doing in portugal mate yeah so i was actually um contrary to belief i was actually working and <laughs> i um, was driving four different cars two bmws and two minis uh, the bmws in particular were the new x2 and ix2 uh, which uh, interesting because the departure from the first generation, they're more like a coupe SUV, similar to like the X4 and X6 now. And then uh, whereas I was also driving the Minis, a new Countryman, which is like the largest Mini offered uh, in both petrol and electric geysers, which was very cool. And I also saw something very special, which I can't talk about yet, uh, but it'll be towards the end of the month once I can talk about it more. Yeah, so that'll be on carexpert.com.au, so make sure you keep an eye on the website for that. Uh, but we're going to dive straight into a big announcement that came over the weekend. And now we had another plan of what we're going to talk about today. We've pushed that aside because Kia have officially announced there is going to be a ute in Australia, a Kia ute. Now, uh, they haven't 100% confirmed it, but they've heavily implied it's going to be called the Tasman, which is what we all thought it was going to be called. Mm -hmm. um, the ad, if you haven't seen it, uh, we'll, we'll put a link in the description for it. It features a bunch of Aussie sports stars. Jack and uh, James can probably name most of them because there are a lot of tennis people in there. There was a few tennis players in there, but there was a few like cricketers and footy players, which I'm Straight not an expert on at all. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I've seen them on like the footy show. Yeah, I, I, I recognized <laughs> Ash Barty and that was about the extent yes. of my knowledge. <laughs> Ash Barty was great. So I'll open up to the floor, guys. Feel free to just jump in. Just, uh, and I know details are scarce, but tell us everything we know about the Kia Tasman Ute to date. All right, so the, the Tasman or what they know it internally as, as I think TK, is Kia's upcoming dual cab body on frame Ute to take on everything from the Ranger and Hilux to the, you know, the Triton, D-Max, all that kind of thing. Um, we understand that it's a very different car to what Hyundai's working on. So even though they work, um, Hyundai and Kia are part of the same group, they've got two commercial vehicles coming that are very different cars. Um, we are of the, of the understanding that the Tasman will offer a six cylinder and four cylinder diesel. Mm. Um, there are plans or there are rumors of an electrified version in the future as well. And then obviously because it's coming to market quite late, it's benchmarking against leaders like the Ranger and the Hilux, which also means they're aiming for a three and a half ton towing capacity, one ton payload and all that kind of stuff as well. So in terms of official details though, the only thing we really know is that it's meant to get here around mid 2025. I've actually had that confirmed to me personally um, in interviews. So we're about 12 months or just beyond that of seeing this car in market. And as you can imagine, it'll be, you know, tuned to Australian conditions, they're doing a lot of development testing at the moment. So it's a really exciting product because Kia has not been really in the commercial space in this way, at least in Australia. I know in other markets, Hyundai and Kia sort of compete into some different segments depending on um, where you look. But you know they have to get it right because the ute segment is a very brand and nameplate led. And so it's a, a new offering. But I think if, if anyone's gonna can get it right, I feel like Kia can, so. Mm. And we've um, already seen like a bunch of uh, prototypes and things like that, all camouflage still at this stage. Um, but the Ute is, it's a real thing and it's happening and 2025 is like just around the corner. So like 12 months, as you said, James, so it's really not that long. The car is finished, uh, probably just doing some suspension tuning and stuff like that, which will be exciting for Australian buyers at least anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just around the corner. Mm. So we know um, they've been benchmarking against uh, Ranger and a Hilux, which is Smart move, let's straight out of the box. Um, but we also know Kia have for a long time done a lot of ride and handling tuning on their models for like in Australia for the domestic market. And when you look at Hyundai who don't really do that and then you compare sort of equivalent Kia vehicles, the Kias always ride a lot better on Aussie roads. So I guess, could we could we sort of expect that the Ute's gonna be a similar thing? It's really, it's probably gonna work quite well in Aussie conditions. 
Well, you'd hope so. I would say for a ute at least anyway, with local testing, they'd be wanting to test vehicle or the ute so it can have a high payload and also tow a lot of, uh, like a trailer, really heavy stuff, and also still maintain a uh, solid, steady driving with all of the weights. Um, I think they'd be silly not to, given the competition and how well the Ranger and the Hilux both do it. So in the States, Hyundai have uh, the Santa Cruz, which is, it's sort of like a Santa Fe with a tray on the back of it, I guess. Tucson, it's a, actually. A Tucson, it's, it's genuinely it's a Tucson face with a tray right. on the back. So. There you go. So it's, a, it's an SUV that's become a ute as opposed to how we normally do it where it's a ute that becomes an SUV. This thing is not that at all. It's not built off any of the platforms. But I guess in terms of size, what sort of, uh, and uh, we can compare it to current Kia vehicles, what sort of size are we expecting it to be? I'd say it'd probably, what's the largest SUV, the one that's not offered in Australia? Right. Yeah, I imagine it'd be quite similar to that because it's it seems to be, at least from prototypes uh, that I've seen so far, that it's, it's quite big and it's really boxy and bluff. So lots of square edges and um, yeah, square elements throughout the entire uh, vehicle. Yeah, so the, the other thing that people might not know is back in Korea, Kia offers a car called the Mojave, which is like their, it's sort of like a Prado alternative. It's a, it's a ladder frame SUV that has a V6 diesel engine. Um, they've had it around for a long time. They used to sell it in the States as well with a V8. And that's the car that currently the prototypes sort of seem to be a bit of a mishmash of. So the front of them, you'll see that boxy front end is from actually the Mojave. And I don't know, I think we seem to think that there might be... Um, links to it genetically with this ute. It might be a development of this platform given it's already there and they're just probably gonna update it to, or you know, engineer it to cater to the payload and towing capacities that we already have. And that also makes, a, makes it a logical next step for the powertrains. Cause yeah, they've got a three liter V6 in their portfolio that they just need to engineer for right-hand drive and export conditions. Um, and you know, that car, even though it's old, if you um, do some research online, it's actually quite a plush thing. So it might sort of be like what Sangyong does where it's quite like car-like and plush inside, but then still has some rugged capability as well. So I think it's a really interesting product and they've done a pretty good job at keeping a lid on all the details so far. Something that I am um, interested in particular was uh, with NVES, with the emissions things that are coming into play really soon, whether that's going to mess up the potential of getting a, a V6, I'd be really interested to see if that is the case or whether we might be getting like the 2.2 litre uh, four cylinder diesel from like the Sorento or Staria load, that kind of vehicle. Yeah, I think um, Korea is already Euro 6. Right. So I think Korea and Japan, I think are somewhere around like Euro 6B standards. So Except for Toyota, but we'll gloss over yeah. that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the, the, the technology is already there. Okay. I think it's just a matter of making sure that that comes to market at a mm -hmm. reasonable price because that obviously adds cost, but. Of yeah. course. So we, we think this will, well, considering they've been benchmarking against them, this will be up there with Ranger and Hilux probably in terms of price and in terms of like the luxuries, the drive, all that sort of stuff. That's where we're thinking. I would say so, yeah. Keys are usually pretty plush, so I would say absolutely. Yep, and do we know who's designed it? Is it is it the usual team or have they brought in someone special for it? Or we, or we don't know anything we yet? We don't know. I have no clue, unfortunately, okay. sorry. All right, well, well, we'll hopefully see something soon. I'm sure some renders will appear on the internet sooner or later and we'll be able to talk about them and get an idea of what it's going to look like. But um, I don't know about you guys, I'm quite excited for a Kia mm. Ute or the Kia Tasman, if that is what it's called. <laughs> um, based on one one particular shot in the, the TV commercial where a dart lands right in the middle of the Tasman Sea, I think that yeah. um, unless it comes out and it's called the Kia C which <laughs> not quite as interesting, but the Tasman, um, at now I guess, I'm sure we have people from New Zealand who listen. Uh, what are the chances it might end up there too, or, or do we not know yet? I don't think we really know too much about their plans. The only real official confirmation that we've got is that it's coming mm, yeah. and it will be here at some point next year, yep. probably around mid-year. Um, I think the only other thing is that because our market is such an important ute market and we're probably a primary market for this vehicle, we won't have any of the supply issues that Kia's been having across its lineup. They'll be putting their hand up and getting first in line to make sure they get plenty of them. Because I think with this car, their Kia Australia is looking to become, you know, top three, top two manufacturer, which would help them cement themselves in our market, but also make a case with global to be like, you know, 
this this place is very important for us. So you need to give us more of a priority with you know all the products that they can and can't get currently. Like sportage and things like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> all right. Well, we look forward to it. And as we get more information, uh, it'll be on the Car Expert website and we will most likely be talking about it on here because it's a very exciting prospect. Right, Jack, it is your time to shine, mate. Yes. We are, were you recently, oh, it was a couple of weeks, probably before you went to Portugal, you went and yeah. drove the new Hyundai i30, and let me make sure I get this right, sedan N, yeah, it is not a bit N of a, sedan. That's correct. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a weird way to say it. So it's i30 sedan N because i30 sedan is the model sure. and then N is the, the variant per se. It was all tied in um, with the launch of the hybrid, which uh, all the reviews are now live on the website. Um, but yeah, focusing today, particularly on the N, it was a really cool uh, launch actually, lots of driving. Uh, we were based out of Aubrey and we did a bunch of really cool driving loops and roads. It was a long time too, it was like uh, two hours or something and lots of Ks. And then the next day uh, we drove the cars to uh, Winton and we did some track uh, driving in the exact same cars, um, which was really fascinating because they just, the cars were awesome and like we'd just driven them the day pre prior and then on the track and then I also drove one away from the launch and it was completely fine. The only thing they changed, I think, were just the tyres so that it had a little bit more security just in case yeah. they'd been worn down throughout the day. We will come back to the track stuff because I know that's a big thing, especially with um, N owners and N owner groups. But um, let's just run through a little bit of details about it. So it's uh, it's a, a fifty two thousand dollars thereabouts, isn't it? Yeah. So fifty two grand, as you said, Sean, before on road costs, and that is for uh, either the dual clutch or the manual. So you can still get the no manual cost option, auto or manual. Yeah, that's brilliant. either or. The only option uh, for this car is a two grand sunroof, which I would be personally not going for, given it's a, a sporty car. But yeah, 52 grand for this kind of car is definitely a bargain. When you think of, say, like the Civic Type R, that's like a fair bit more expensive than this, but it's a similar kind of ethos, performance, and if anything, this Career, the, the amount of noises and sounds this car makes is arguably more fun mm. than the Civic Type R2. So it's it's a two liter four uh, cylinder turbo, yep. 206 kilowatts, 392 um, uh, newton, meters. newton meters of torque, yeah. there you go, sorry I got there then, still early on a Monday. Front wheel drive, so it's it's living with the hot hatch uh, yeah. ethos, it's sticking with it. Mm -hmm. How was it, I guess, well, like I said, we'll come to the track stuff, so we'll just focus on the road. Yeah. How did it all feel when you actually got out and started getting into some twisties with it? It was really fun. Um, there's a lot going on with that front axle. Um, so like in town in particular, you'll notice it the most, the, the turning circle is a little bit crap um, and it will sometimes like tramp a little bit under fast acceleration and stuff like that. Um, but once you get out on the road, it like, you just, is so connected with the car. Um, it's so planted and direct and the steering is fantastic. I, um, really liked trying, uh, driving with the, the dual clutch in particular out in the twisties, um, because you could do paddle shifters and you didn't have to worry about the manual transmission. Although I do love a manual transmission, I'd rather just not bother and have it do it for me. And um, all of the different drive modes, and you can play with all of them, the end modes, the end custom modes. There are so many different varieties and variables with this car that it's so fun. And um, that's not even getting to um, the end grin shift, which adds, it's like an overboost function it's retained from a uh, pre-facelift, but it just adds that little bit of extra power for I think a, I think it's about 20 seconds or so. It's not necessarily noticeable, but like you just, it puts everything on 100% go and it's um, really quite fun. Yeah, the grin, the grin I think is the key word in Yes, in, in it makes you grin and that's the, <laughs> the point. I remember having a chat with all of the Hyundai people. The point of this car isn't to necessarily be the fastest, but it's to make you have a fun time and smile every time you start it up, you're driving it and when you hop out of it, because that's when that uh, feedback gets passed on to other people. You're like, oh, okay, oh my God, this car is so fun. You should get one yourself. Yeah. Well, as we learned uh, recently in our hot hatch drag race that we did, the what well, was an older model i30 in um, uh, hatchback, it walloped. It was so fast, it was unbelievable. So, and that was a DCT as well, if I recall. So, the sedan's quicker. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So look out. Um, now, like I said, we are coming to track stuff. I promise, Jack. We'll get to it. Um, but I'm curious. 
Looks are very subjective. This is one thing we know. Personally, I think that the sedan looks brilliant. Mm -hmm. But what do you guys think? I'll open up to both of you. What do you guys think of how it looks? I think the, the facelift looks really, really great. I, I was somebody that liked the previous one, even though it was a little bit polarizing with like the insecty aggressive face. But I think this new one is really, really clean and the the new wheels that we get the forged alloy wheels as standard i think they have another option like a machined option that sort of looks like the alpha telephone hole oh, style yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah i just think it looks really good and and the, it's still, they've retained the color options so there's a few different shades and colors that you can get which yeah, performance be, blue which is important yes <laughs> um and there's like a nice red that looks good in black um there's also a really bright blue now there's that what's that color called it's like a, that electric blue sort I don't of color the name for, but you know sorry. the one i'm talking I about do. yeah so yeah i think it, it looks really smart and sort of like using Jack's um, reference as the, the Civic, this is sort of like a, a much cheaper version of that, which is louder than the Civic. It may not be quite as sharp for a lap time, but these things are so much fun and just, it, I think it looks really, really sleek now. What about you, Jack? I'm in a similar boat, actually. I, I quite liked the pre-facelift. I liked that car a lot. Um, with this facelift and now gets like a whale shark look. So it's got like this big <laughs> grill, um, which isn't for everyone in all honesty. And I can understand that completely, um, but it is nice at the front. You now get LED uh, indicators and it just feels more tightly and, and like a nicer package overall. I also like the, the forged um, alloy wheels. I think they look really nice and I'm quite glad all around the back front, you still get that sporty body kit that makes you say, or oh, this is like, this is an N, this is properly sporty. Yeah, it looks like a touring car. It looks like it's ready to hit the racetrack, which it's now, we'll talk about it now, Jack. I know, you are, I know you're eager. <laughs> so one of the big things with um, N owners, there's a lot of, like the N owners group is massive and they do track days and Hyundai warrant the car for track days. So how does the i30 sedan N go when you actually hit the track? Yeah, it's, Fantastic. <laughs> to, to, to put a, a long story short, it's fantastic. As you said, there are so many different modes. I think um, probably best suited to say the dual clutch because it is quicker. The gear changes are faster and you don't have that user error of like changing gears, wrong gears, all that kind of fun stuff. With the dual clutch in particular, it has a, a track sense mode that um, it knows when you're on track due to how you're driving the car and your throttle inputs. And because of that, it will uh, do the, the most efficient, or not efficient, the, the fastest uh, gear changes and hold the revs up high so that you have all the power ready to go when you uh, turn out of the corner. Um, be it. It's a fantastic kind of car. Um, the only thing I noticed is maybe after like a few harder stops, the brake pedal was a little bit, uh, not not iffy, but like it just felt, I didn't quite feel as It's a bit confident. squidgy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> confident stopping. So I just allow a little bit more um, time for slowing down. I'm not necessarily the fastest. Oh, I know that I'm Jack Quick, but I'm not like, <laughs> I'm not the fastest around, the, uh, around a circuit. I don't claim to be either. I just really had a lot of fun driving the car around in both manual and dual clutch guises, particularly uh, the manual because I didn't have to do uh, heel toe fun stuff because you also have that rev matching feature, which for novice race car racing drivers per se, um, so like myself, I don't claim to be anything flash on the track, um, is really handy and it just um, takes that stress out of driving fast. So we tested, uh, Paul had a, uh, there's a video on you, the YouTube channel now, Paul tested it and got under six seconds, zero to 100. It's very wow. impressive. That is drive car. bloody quick. Mm -hmm. Does it feel it when you're actually out there and giving it to it? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, there are Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires that make the car feel so sticky and planted, especially when the tires are warm too. So I'm not surprised whatsoever. The only thing you notice is just around town, if the tires are cold, you'll just get a little bit of front wheel slip. But for the most part, if the tires are warm, six seconds, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it still has all the pops and crackles. Oh my God, yes. Oh good. Yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I um, When I drove one home, uh, the DCT from uh, Winton back to Melbourne, I went to uh, my dance training in that evening and I went along um, East Link through the tunnel there. So I decided <laughs> to put it into um, N mode, of course, as I should. As you do. And then I think it ch I changed it um, all the way back down to second, which was quite fun. Um, I was sitting at about like 5,000 revs um, and it sounded like 
gunshots yeah. and i was so obsessed i was like oh my god this is so fun i bet you everyone else is terrifying but, uh, terrified i should say jack hooligan quick yes <laughs> you're called hoonigan at this right yeah, <laughs> yeah um one thing that i wanted to mention with this is sure all of these performance thing uh, performance things uh, are still really nice to be retained uh with the facelift but there is one super annoying thing that is common to a bunch of hyundai and kia updated models is it finally gets that um intelligence speed limit assist function mm, i was going to ask you about this yes yeah so um when you go it detects a speed limit sign and when you go over that uh, speed limit for a certain period of time it's a, a really annoying chime plays um and it is quite prominent in the i30 sedan n you can turn it off but you have to go into the touch screen or regardless you have to use a touch screen and you have to do it every single time you drive the car there's no way to permanently turn it off without doing something sketchy that I wouldn't recommend at all. So does it disengage when you go into end mode or track mode? It's oh. still there. Okay, well, that's okay. I guess, look, for all the upsides, you could, that's probably the one downside I could live with with that car. Maybe not in a, a Santa Fe but or a Tucson, but personally in that, I think it'd be okay. Um, James, I do want to ask you quick, uh, I, I know you didn't get to go and drive it on a track, but um, I know you've had spent a bit of time in these cars over the years. How do you feel about the i30 sedan and do you think it's still like it's still where it should be? Do you think it's still competitive in the market? Yeah, I think as the, the, the market sort of changed a little bit because when this car first came out and the hatchback as well, like, you know, I, the, the, my Golf GTI was like 48 grand drive away when these cars were brand new, right? And, and they were like 40 grand for the, the hatch when it came yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. So like they've gone up a little bit in price, but where a lot of it, their competitors now are going to the sixty, seventy thousand dollars bracket, this has stayed in like the low to mid 50s, which I think really has to be commended from Hyundai to offer a really capable, fun, attainable performance car, which I think is really core to the N brand because it's all about, you know, having cars that people can buy and have a lot of fun in right out of the box that they don't have to spend a whole lot of money on. Um, and you can still take it to the track. You can have fun on the road. And I think that they've really maintained that level of fun and just character in this car, having not driven the one that Jack brought back to Melbourne, but hearing it in the car park and just how loud it was. It's, it really just makes a statement. And if you get it in like a cool color or something, it really cuts a line in traffic and it just feels special. And for 50 grand, like what more could you want? Look, it, Jack's full written review is on the car expert website we've got a full video review on the car expert youtube channel so make sure you check those out if you want to know more about it and if you're considering buying one uh have you heard that we've got a service that can help you get into one quicker than you might think it's called help me car expert it's very easy go to google type in help me car expert and it'll take you to a page you see some pictures of paul and he can help connect you uh, to a dealer you can talk to a consultant who's based here in australia so they know where you are and what you're talking about and we maybe even get you into a hyundai i30 sedan n or a hat if you're into that sooner than you might think and if you do use the service leave a comment let us know how it was so google help me car expert all right guys time to talk about our final topic for today it's the one that people have been asking for we've all been waiting a long time uh it's the mitsubishi triton yep uh, in the, the hot seat today yes um so paul first previewed this in thailand quite a long time ago yeah it was like six months ago now yep and then he went to uh south australia and drove a prototype yeah. um and, and then I went to South yeah. Australia and drove the production model. Yes, yeah, so now so now we've driven it. It's just been driven off road and on road on your on your little jaunt over to Adelaide. Yeah. I guess we'll do, actually, actually let's start top level. Let's start yeah. top level. Let's talk about what is uh, what's changed since the what last one to this one. New yes. What is the new Gen Triton? Yes. So what's changed from the the one that's that we've come to know for quite a while now to mm. this new one? Uh, so it's quite a significant redevelopment of this car. So it's on. They say it's on an all new chassis. I won't know if it's a completely new platform, but it's a very very heavily revised one. So they've made it more capable. It's stronger. It's more rigid. It's got a new engine with um, two turbos instead of one. So now it's got like 150 kilowatts for 570 yeah. newton meters. Yep, that's so, what we got. Yeah, right up there. <laughs> I'm trying not to refer to the notes. I'm trying to use my, my very dense brain. Um, but yeah, so it's they've upgraded the towing capacity to three and a half tons. Um, there's a lot more tech in it as well. Tech and safety was a really, really big part of it because the old one was 
quite old. So that you know, they're, they're trying to bring it in line with all of the class leaders. You know, the Ute segment is so so competitive, particularly in Australia. You've got you know Ranger, Amarok, D Max, BT Fifty, Hilux. Even the Hilux has been very like developed through the years, even though that's also a very old. They've had a lot of time to develop it, to be fair. Well, and Mitsubishi <laughs> had a lot of time to develop the Triton and didn't quite do enough mm. with the old one, especially later on in its life. So they've sort of kept the foundations that made the old one so good. It's still really great off road. You've got that really swish um, super select all wheel drive, four wheel drive system. Well, it's an updated version now as well, isn't it? I think that actual system is the same. Okay. Um, they said that's largely carryover, but they've added things like the active yaw control and, and a uh, rear differential to maximize the capability off road. Um, and it's a it's physically a, a bigger vehicle. So it's longer, it's wider, it's got a um, bigger tray, it's got you know all those kinds of things. So it's, it's a very, very big deal for um, Mitsubishi Motors. And I think that we had the lead um, development or engineer, lead of the development of this nameplate in Australia for the launch. And he was a very um, fascinating and um, enthusiastic Japanese man um, who just, he knew everything and he loves off-roading. He's, he's very, very passionate. And you know they started the development on this model in 2017. So it's been a really long time coming for them. And the game's changed a lot since that era as well. So yeah, it was really great to drive. So we started off in like Adelaide from the airport, drove through town in the city and then out into the country and round. And um, I think it's a place called Sanderston where um, there's a, a four wheel drive park there that we took it up some trails and went from fairly mild and like rock, like not too tough rocky stuff to some more gnarly things that we did as well. So I was quite impressed with how it performed. Uh, so it's gone through the range of treatment, longer, wider, an extra turbo, all the all the things. So I guess maybe they've looked at Ranger and said that's a great idea. <laughs> but how how does it transfer? Because I guess uh, and you were there when we did our mega test with the previous generation Triton, and we found that obviously you didn't do any towing, but when it was towing, it it just didn't. It wasn't quite up to snuff. You know, it wasn't quite there. It didn't quite have enough power. It just sort of felt quite old. How does the new one feel? when you're comparing to the old one. Yeah, so we didn't, unfortunately couldn't do a, a tow test or a payload test, but given I have driven the previous one a number of times in normal conditions that a lot of people would be driving those cars or utes, um, it definitely feels a lot more effortless and more refined. It doesn't feel like it's working as hard to do normal things. Um, the extra grunt is definitely welcome. It makes you know urban driving much easier. It's very, very settled on the highway as well. Um, I think it actually is a much better tourer than it is as like a, an everyday thing. When we were driving the high spec models unladen, the rear suspension is still quite jittery in town and that was something that we complained about the last one it's leaf sprung still yeah, yeah. so there's st still leaf sprung the high spec ones have the standard duty suspension the base ones have a heavy duty rear setup so the base ones are probably even harsher again without a, a load or weight in the tray but um yeah when, when you take away that Real, like sort of bumpy and unsettled ride at low speeds. You get it up to like 100, 110 clicks and it's actually really, really settled. My favorite aspect of the driving experience actually was the, the steering. So there's this new variable, um, variable ratio electric power steering rack, which is, I don't know how to describe it other than saying like, it felt like a really nice car to steer. It's got this really direct communicative steering rack that, you know, a lot of the new utes now with are really over assisted. So they're quite light to the point where they're almost vague when you're driving on the freeway that you're constantly making these like little corrections. Whereas this just felt really like put together and tight the same way that we've sort of enjoyed in a lot of new smaller cars. So it just made it really easy to handle. Um, and it's very, very quiet and refined unless you're really gunning the, the, you know, like most four cylinder diesels, they can get a little bit rattly and stuff under really hard acceleration. But other than that, it was just like a really nice, well-rounded package. Is it a range of beta? I don't think so. It doesn't offer a more powerful engine option. It doesn't have an electrified option yet. You know, there's things on the horizon with Mitsubishi. They've sort of confirmed that there is an all-electric Ute coming. Whether it's a Triton, I don't know. They've sort of hinted at there might be more power or a hybrid version coming. You know, Mitsubishi has their really great plug-in hybrid tech. But as it stands now, I think what the Triton serves as is a much more well-rounded alternative to the four-cylinder Ute set. So when you think about like Hilux, it's much more technologically developed than the Hilux in my opinion. The new infotainment system is straight out of the Outlander and mm. the X-Trail. Oh, that's it, a great system. It's a great fair. system. Yeah. It has wireless Apple CarPlay across the range, the satellite navigation, DAB radio from I think one up from base right. and you just 
plug your phone or not plug your phone, but you know, your wireless link connect your phone and you're on your way. Um, the the new driver assist systems are much more advanced. It's got like nine airbags. So it's gonna be a much safer vehicle for people who use utes as their lifestyle family vehicle. Um, and I just, it, it, it was definitely, even compared to like a D-Max or a BT-50, the infotainment in the Isuzu and the Mazda sort of shit me because if it's got all the stuff on paper, but in, in how it works in the real world, it's a little bit slow, it's a little yeah. bit laggy, and the interface looks a little bit cheap, whereas this feel looks and feels like a normal passenger product. Um, and the, the cabin now is a little bit bigger, the trimmings are nicer, it just feels more up to date and just does the job a lot better. And it's like, even for a top spec one, like low 60s, that's what you're looking at for like an XLT Ranger. And that's not even a full X XLT Ranger, is it? We haven't actually mentioned the price yet. Um, oh, we've yeah. talked a lot about it. So it starts the base spec and and I think there's a base year spec that may yeah, come later. Yeah, there's more variants coming. Yeah, but the current base one starts at just under 44 grand mm -hmm. and it goes up to just uh, around 64,000 for the top spec before on roads, yeah. which, Compared to, like you said, compared to a range is a relative bargain because we had an XLT by turbo long termer mm. and it was like 72 grand on the road. Like it yeah. was, it was very expensive. So this is a lot cheaper. Yeah. And that's including pretty significant price rises yeah. across the range. I think the base ones are up by about four grand and then you get up to the GLS and GSR and you're looking at closer to seven, but there's quite a lot that's gone in there. And you, when you think about like value for money, you're getting much more power and capability, a much nicer cabin and a lot more tech than the old one. And it should be much safer. So there's a lot of things in there and you know, when it's in line with its competitors now in a lot of ways, and in some cases better, I think, you know, they can deserve, they do deserve to sort of charge a little bit more in line with what the market's charging. Plus you also have the um, conditional 10 year warranty, which- 10 years? Yeah. Wow, so if you service that's pretty it, good. <laughs> if you service it at authorized Mitsubishi dealers for those 10 years, you get a, um, a 10 year um, extended vehicle warranty, which co covers you for a really long time. And there's cap price servicing for that period. And this one is cheaper to service than the old one by about $50 over the long term. But um, they've made adjustments to various things. I think there was one part in there that doesn't need to be serviced the same schedule as the old one. So, you know, may, when everything's going up these days, the fact that they've been able to sort of par that back a little bit is um, is pretty good. So, you know, you at least can be rest assured that the car should still be running quite a long time into the future should you, you know, if you're buying it as a, a first work ute or, you know, somebody that just wants something that can do all the things that a ute can mm. and it'll last you a long time, you know, there's at least some backing there to make sure that you're you're covered in the, in the event of an unfortunate thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, um, uh, are we expecting to see a new Pajero Sport anytime soon on a base, like based off the ute? Yeah, I think there is one in the pipeline, but I think it's still a couple of years away. Yeah. I think the, the Triton's been the priority because that, that also released first yeah. by, by a number of years. I think the Pajero Sport will follow. I think Mitsubishi put out a roadmap for new products and I think it was like 2026. Mm. So it's still a couple of years away. Um, but yeah, be, if the Pajero Sport picks up what this got, and the Pajero Sport is a little bit more developed than the previous Triton with an eight-speed auto, which this doesn't get yet because Mitsubishi decided that the six-speed worked better for the Triton application. Yep. But you know, you think about what a Pajero Sport could be with all that new tech and a fresh design, and that'll be a really great product as well. Mm. Well, the current Pajero Sport's pretty good, so yeah. it should be a good upgrade. Now, when Paul went to Thailand and checked out these when they first launched it, there was a whole bunch of really cool models, all the variations. There was a race Ute yeah. and, but there was one, and I think this got a lot of people excited. It was like absolute tradey road worker spec with a manual. Oh, yeah. Is that, do we know if that's going to come to Australia? Yes. Yeah, so at the moment, they're launching with the dual cabs and they're all auto only. The two base grades, I think you have two wheel drive options and then the rest are four wheel drive. Um, Mitsubishi has confirmed that there are cab chassis and I think they call it a club cab, which is like a super cab sort of thing. I think yep. I'm not familiar with all these yeah. terminologies, but you'll you'll know what I'm talking yep. about. And the people watching probably will know what that means. Um, and there'll be manual versions of I think some of those as well. So there are manuals coming. They'll probably be just for the base grades, but there are cheaper. Um, and more uh, tradie focused ones on the way. Mm, well, I mean, that's it. Most tradies are probably going to go and buy the top spec anyway. But um, yeah, I, I think that uh, having that option, even if it's not here, is coming is, is going to be a big deal for them because Ranger don't have anything like that anymore. Uh, yeah. I think Workmate, uh, it's hard to get a manual Workmate Hilux these days. Well, that's so. the thing, isn't it? They sort of occupy an interesting part of the market because Ranger is so successful in high spec private 4x4, whereas 
Hilux does really well with fleets in 4x2 and the cheaper specs as well as some of the higher ones. I guess with um, with the Triton, it can sort of occupy a similar part of the market that the Hilux does, but it can appeal to perhaps more private buyers that want to shop in that segment as opposed to spending so much, because some people spend ridiculous money on these things, like mm-hmm. Rangers going for 80, 90. Mm-hmm. And they spend another that much on accessories. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, people, what people spend on 70 series, I know it's a completely different class of car, but you know, that kind of money that people have to spend, like, you know, six grand on a ute's really not that expensive for a lot of people anymore so you can get a decked out triton for that absolutely now um navara we know the next generation navara is going to share a lot of things with it allegedly allegedly (laughs) we did ask them that question and um you know because there was some sort of scuttlebutt at some point saying that the navara and triton would essentially be the same thing but reskinned uh when we posed that question to the mitsubishi team they basically said You can ask Nissan what they're doing, but (laughs) the Triton has been a Mitsubishi project. So I think what perhaps the Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance does differently to something like a Volkswagen group is there are shared parts and technologies, but they're not necessarily shared in development. They basically, the companies sort of take the stuff away, do their own development and engineering, and then they sort of come to market with a product that has all the same ingredients, but a completely different fi- um, finished product. And so, the key one for people that don't know is um, x and Outlander being essentially the same car, but they look very different. Very on the different. Outside. And, you know, the, even just in terms of the electrification strategies, you've got Outlander with plug-in hybrid, but Nissan with e-power. So, you know, the platforms can facilitate a number of different things, but they're still very, very different cars despite having shared DNA. So I think that's just going to be the similar case with the Navara. We still don't know when the new Navara is coming. Nissan really hasn't said much. I don't even know if we've seen prototypes yet. There's really just not a lot out there. So perhaps with everything going on in the in the segment and the industry, Nissan's perhaps gone back to the drawing board and is might be doing something different. We don't know. But yeah, they were pretty confident that they were like, you know, this has been only us and we've done this. Nissan's not had any import if you want to know what they're doing you're going to have to ask them and we've asked them and they don't tell us anything so <laughs> now jack i know you've spent a lot of time in this job driving probably almost every single ute that's on the market these by now and almost all the variants as well how do you think that the new triton is going to stack up compared to and that's probably not going to go and kill a ranger like james said but how do you think it's going to stack up in the ute market yeah it's hard to say without actually having driven it yet but i at least on paper and how i see it so far i think it's going to be a really good Isuzu D-Max and Mazda BT-50 rival. I don't think, as James said, I don't think it's going to really have, it, it might come close to say Ranger, Amarok and Hilux, but I think it's going to occupy in between Isuzu D-Max, BT-50 and Ranger in that spot really nicely. So upper middle tier is where yeah, we're looking. Yeah, pretty much. And pricing reflects that too. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I guess, it's been a long time coming that we're like seeing all these updates to Utes because pretty much every Ute on the market has, has been quite old for some time. Uh, do you guys think that there's a bit of a movement to make Utes cars rather than, than, than have them as Utes anymore? Because we saw with Ranger and Amarok, very plush inside. Um, we're seeing with uh, this now very plush inside. Do you think this over the next couple of years, we're just going to see more and more car Utes rather than Ute Utes? Yeah. It's funny you say that because as we mentioned at the start with the the so-called Kia Tasman, I think that is going to be in a similar boat where it's going to be pushed for like a, a almost car-like driving experience with the capability of having 3.5 tonne towing and a tonne of payload. So yes, I think that's a development that's definitely in the works. And another that comes to mind straight away is the new, uh, sorry, forthcoming BYD ute. I reckon that is going to be extremely flash, Um, but also still very capable. And everyone is buying a ute to not only live with it every day, go to work, but then go away and have some fun, go for a drive, touring, uh, four-wheel driving, stuff like that. So it makes more sense to straddle it 50-50 for a passenger car sense because the Triton, as James said, is still quite firm suspension wise, which means that it's a very capable vehicle, but it offers a plush interior that can rival essentially like an Outlander. So I 
Absolutely. I think that's the direction that we're heading in. Mm. Okay. Well, something to look forward to, I suppose, because um, I don't know, you, you drive the American pickups and they're huge, but they mm. feel very nice and comfortable to drive for the most part. So, and actually that's what you're off to drive uh, later this week, isn't I it, Jack? I am, yeah. The new uh, Silverado Heavy Duty. Mm. I am very keen for that. I can't talk about it just yet, um, but she's a big mama and she's <laughs> very expensive. Yep. And the reason that you're going is because you're the only one in the office has a truck license. You're the only one qualified to drive such <laughs> I know, thing. right? Yeah, I have a, a heavy rigid license, which is... <laughs> which um, is suitable for a HD Silverado, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, which is funny enough. Um, but yeah, I'm very keen to drive that. And I feel like I'm very well placed given I've already experienced uh, experienced um, F-150, Tundra and the like. This is that next class above. So I'm really excited. Mm. And what about you, James? What are you up to this week? So I know you're off on a little jaunt as well. Yes, yeah, so I'm driving the new Nissan Qashqai ePower, which has been a really long time coming. It was meant to come like two years ago. Um, I did the launch of the standard models, I think at the end of 2022 or something. So I think Paul went and drove, uh, looked at that quite some time ago as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, been, it's been a really long time coming. It's been available in Europe for ages. They finally brought it here. I'm actually really excited to drive it because I think, you know, while enthusiasts watching or listening to us might be like SUVs, hybrids, whatever, when you look at what our industry is doing in terms of the market, this is the kind of car that people are really, really interested in. And I think if it can be a really compel compelling option in that market space, it just changes things up. And it means that the people have a real, another really good choice because as we've reported, while things are getting better, Toyota the RAV4 hybrids, for example, are still a little bit hard to get. And options from other brands are fairly limited if people want that sort of small to mid-size SUV for their family, but are conscious about fuel use. So yeah, excited to drive that as well. And one last question before we wrap up, we've asked the other guys this uh, earlier this year, Jack, what car are you most looking forward to driving in 2024? Oh, I feel like I've already driven it actually, oh, but it was early this year. I was really looking forward to driving um, Ionic 5N yep. and it, um, not to sell the, sell the story short, but it was, it lived up to that expectation too. It's a, it's a very cool car. Mm, but we're getting that through the office uh, soon, hopefully. So I'm looking forward to and we'll having have a, a review because I just did the launch, the full launch of that um, on road and on track last week and the review will be live this Friday to go with the coverage that Jack's already done. Very so exciting. a lot of exciting stuff to come. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here today, Jack. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. And I think you're about to head off to the airport and uh, go and do your thing. So yeah, yeah, we better let you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks both of you for coming, James, as always, and Jack for taking the time out of your day. And thank all of you for watching. We're going to be back next week. Scott will be back here again. He's driving a Peugeot, I think. Yeah, the, the new E3008. Yeah, there you go. So that'll be something to talk about, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, he might come back speaking in only French. Yes, yes. So if Scott's got croissant crumbs down in his front <laughs> next week, you'll know why. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining us. Make sure if you're listening, you leave us a review. Uh, five stars would be preferable. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit that subscribe button and make sure you ring the bell so you're notified every time a new podcast goes live. Boys, thanks for coming and joining us. And thanks all of you for watching. We'll see you next week.